All righty, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning on in. Today we're going to be discussing what if Interstate 35 were high-speed rail. Like the Interstate 40 high-speed rail video last time, we're going to be breaking this down into sections discussing the route, the projected travel times, and then the projected costs. And like last time, we will compare the current state of the art, which is driving or flying or taking Amtrak, to the projected travel times and costs associated with building higher speed rail as well as true high-speed rail. And we're going to assume that higher speed rail travels at 120 miles an hour, whereas true high-speed rail travels at 200 miles an hour. For the cost calculations, we'll use Brightline Florida for the 120 mile an hour high airspeed rail and California high speed rail for the 200 mile an hour high speed rail. Additionally, we're going to use Brightline West for those cost calculations as well. Just so we get a clearer picture, considering that the geography of California is so mountainous, and it's probably not fair to assume that the rest of the country is that mountainous. After we discuss projected costs, then we'll move on to talk about the difficulties associated with selling this idea, as well as getting this built and operating a system like this. Then we'll close with a conclusion. So let's get started. So where would the route go? For the most part, it would follow Interstate 35 pretty closely going from Laredo, Texas all the way to Duluth, Minnesota. But there would be one minor deviation and that would be in Kansas when you get to Emporia. Rather than going direct to Kansas City from Emporia, you would detour to Topeka to serve the 230,000 some odd residents in the Kansas State Capitol. It would give them access to the route and it would help the residents of Kansas get to the state capital to deal with matters on the state level. So building this thing out, it would actually make the most sense to start with a route going from San Antonio all the way to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Then after that initial operating segment was built, the two bookend segments to Duluth and Laredo could be built. One thing worth noting and one of the benefits to this route is the fact that Amtrak already runs from San Antonio to Oklahoma City. So, those tracks and those trains already exist. Unfortunately, they only run one or two trains a day, and it takes seven hours to go from San Antonio all the way to Fort Worth, and 14 hours to go from San Antonio all the way to Oklahoma City, which is not competitive with driving. Like last time, to calculate the travel time between cities, we're gonna assume that each stop on a train adds 10 minutes for both high-speed and higher-speed rail. We assume that higher speed rail goes 120 miles an hour while true high speed rail goes 200 miles an hour. And we assume that you drive at a consistent 70 miles an hour without any stops for bathroom breaks or gasoline or food breaks. That's pretty generous, but that's what we're going with to be consistent with last time. If this route were to be built, it would take only 2.8 hours with higher speed rail to go from San Antonio all the way to Fort Worth. And it would only take 1.8 hours to go from San Antonio to Fort Worth on high speed rail. This is one of those cases where flying does beat out high speed rail, seeing that it only takes an hour and 15 minutes to fly direct into the DFW airport. But you have to go through security and you have to wait and then you have to board. Boarding a train is much faster than boarding a plane. So really, I think it's a wash driving or flying in this case but it's certainly faster than the seven hour Amtrak or four and a half hour drive from San Antonio to DFW. Along the entire route, driving would take 22 hours and 40 minutes. Compare that with flying, which takes either six or seven, depending on if you fly into Duluth or Minneapolis, St. Paul. The higher speed train would take roughly 16 hours, while the true high speed rail would take 10 hours and 45 minutes. So over the entire length of the route, High-speed rail is not truly competitive with flying, but where this really starts to shine is those 200 to 400 mile segments. As an example, driving from Oklahoma City to Kansas City or vice versa is a five hour drive, a four hour flight with a layover in DFW, or a just under four hour train ride if you were to go with a higher speed rail option. Going with a true high-speed rail option would be just over two and a half hours. Likewise, going from Kansas City to Des Moines is a nearly three hour drive. But with higher speed rail, that would be cut down to two hours. And with true high speed rail, it would be down to an hour and 20 minutes. As a final example, we'll look at going from Des Moines to Minneapolis. Sure, you can book a direct flight with Delta that only takes an hour and 15 minutes, but they might charge you three, four, maybe even $500 a person. Driving takes three and a half hours, but with high speed rail, it would only take two and a half hours and you wouldn't have to worry about getting gouged by Delta. But with true high speed rail, going from Des Moines to Minneapolis would only take an hour and 40 minutes. There are tons of options for these little sub routes that are between two and roughly 500 miles. I'll put a link to the spreadsheet in the description. So if you all wanna play around with what if scenarios and see how long it would take to go between city pairs, you can do so. Alrighty, so let's talk a little bit about how much something like this would cost. First, we'll take a look at how much it would cost to rebuild the four lane highway all the way from Laredo to Duluth. 
Like last time, we'll take a look at the status of the nation's highways, bridges, and transit conditions report, specifically the 24th edition, which came out in 2016. That report provides estimates of building an interstate highway through flat, rolling, as well as mountainous terrain. But since that report came out in 2016, we have to multiply by 1.2445 to adjust for inflation. Plus, we're going to multiply by 4 to account for the fact that we are building four lanes, two in each direction. Furthermore, we're going to classify everything south of the Kansas-Oklahoma border as flat and everything north of that border as rolling, all the way to Duluth. When we multiply everything out and sum everything up, the cost of building that entire route is $49.5 billion. So, when you divide by the entire distance of that route, it comes out to $31.2 million per mile. So, how does building a train compare to building a four-lane interstate? Well, first, we'll take a look at Brightline, Florida. The cost of building the 237-mile route from Miami all the way to Orlando is $4.2 billion. That comes out to $17.72 million per mile. With Brightline, Florida, you've got to remember, they were using track that already existed on right-of-way that already existed. Sure, there was a little bit of new track construction in Central Florida, but by and large, a lot of the right-of-way already existed, so land acquisition was not an issue. So what about Brightline West, which is slated to run from just outside LA all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada? The total estimated cost of the Brightline West system varies between eight, 10, or even $12 billion. To be conservative, we'll say that it costs $12 billion. The entire length of that route is 218 miles. So when you divide things out, it comes out to $55 million per mile. One thing to point out, a good portion of the Brightline West system is actually slated to run along the Interstate 15 right-of-way. So land acquisition won't be as much of an issue considering that you already have all the land that you need and you don't have to go buy it from landowners. Now let's talk about the cost of the California high-speed rail. This is a contentious and controversial topic to talk about, but it's something that needs to be addressed. The most recent report from California High-Speed Rail estimates that its total cost will be somewhere between $88.5 billion on the low end, all the way to $128 billion on the high end. That comes out to $170 million per mile on the low end, all the way to $250 million per mile on the high end. There are really three issues that plague California High-Speed Rail. The first of which is the fact that you have to go out and acquire land from people, which is an onerous task. The second reason California high-speed rail is so expensive is that you have to tunnel through three mountain passes. The final reason California high-speed rail is so expensive is the fact that it's not well managed and there's not a lot of public oversight. I would love to see California high-speed rail come to fruition, but there needs to be a lot more public support and a lot more people asking the hard questions like why is this so expensive and why is this taking so long while simultaneously supporting it. So, what would the final cost estimate be for building the entire route? Building a Brightline Florida-style train along the route would cost $28 billion, while rebuilding a four-lane interstate would cost $49.5 billion. Building a Brightline West-style train, which would run along the median of the interstate, would cost somewhere around $87 billion. Finally, if building this train cost as much per mile as California high-speed rail, it would cost somewhere between $270 billion on the low end all the way to $396 billion on the high end. That $396 billion is almost half of the United States military's budget for one year. Almost half. Alrighty, so now let's talk about some of the difficulties associated with building a route like this. The first one is definitely the cost and selling the idea to folks. There is one state in particular on this route that likes to elect senators that leave the state and go down to Mexico when an ice storm hits. And in that state, they tried to build high-speed rail from Dallas down to Houston with one stop in Brazos Valley. As the project gained steam, more and more folks became aware of where the route would go, and more and more folks became averse to building the route. They ended up forming a coalition called Texans Against High-Speed Rail, and that coalition successfully impeded progress of building high-speed rail in Texas. When folks are averse to high-speed rail in Texas because they would rather burn gasoline and consume oil, you're already fighting an uphill battle. The other thing is, nobody really knows how expensive this thing's gonna be. We have the estimate for Brightline, we have the estimate for California high-speed rail, and Brightline West has yet to be built, so nobody really knows how expensive it's gonna be. Hopefully, it's just the $12 billion figure, but it could be way more. And in the case of Texas, with their high-speed rail from Dallas down to Houston, the initial estimate started at $10 billion in 2013. But in 2019, that estimate slipped up to $20 billion, and in 2020, it got all the way to $30 billion. If something similar were to happen with building this Interstate 35 high-speed rail, I think there would be more and more opposition to building it. The other issue with building this rail line and selling it to folks 
is immigration. If you build it all the way to the southern border, you've got an opportunity for folks to get all the way through Texas. But that wouldn't be a bad thing, especially if you're transporting them up to Minnesota. Think about it. You've got one state that's perfectly fine with immigration, and the people are more welcoming, and one state that's very averse to it and anti-immigration, and full of folks that are anti-immigration. So, instead of having all the migrants just sit in Texas, you could transport them up to Minnesota. They've got plenty of jobs there that I think those migrants would love to have, and you know Texas no longer has to deal with the problem. It's a win-win. While we're on the topic of immigration, we need to talk about a route that's already been proposed. A few years back, there's a proposal to build high-speed rail from Monterey, a couple hundred miles south of New Rio Laredo and the border, all the way to San Antonio. In a sense, part of this route has already been proposed. The only problem is, would it be compatible with the rail throughout the rest of the nation? To further add to the complexity, the state of Minnesota has already passed a bill appropriating funds to build higher speed rail from Minneapolis to Duluth. So, if you've got two lines already on the bookends, it might be advantageous to make them both compatible. But seeing as Minnesota has already appropriated funds, it might be a good idea to think about how can the rail be extended all the way down the route. Just something to consider. So with that, we're going to wrap this video on up. I really appreciate you all watching. If you got any ideas or any comments on how this video could be made better, or if you didn't like it and you want to let me know in the comments, let me know in the comments. Roast me. I don't know how far ideas like this will go, but like I said earlier, I appreciate you watching. And if you like the idea, go ahead and share the video. We'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much.